Good morning, and welcome to worship here at Dunwoody United Methodist Church. My name is Calissa Dodderman. I am one of the associate pastors here at Dunwoody. And on behalf of both myself and the rest of your clergy and staff here, I want to let you know we're delighted that you've chosen to worship with us. A couple of notes before we get started today. The first is that we are excited to be celebrating our All In Sunday today. This is the culmination of the last couple of weeks when we've been talking about how we can be all in for this community with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Today we'll have an opportunity to turn in our estimate of giving cards. There should be some of those in your pews, and our ushers have extras. Um, and many of you may have already submitted those online. All of that's fine too. Um, but we'll have an opportunity to turn those in, to pray over them, to celebrate the ways that we are supporting this church and this church is supporting us, just to kind of orient you all to what's going on this week. As uh, Pastor Matt Stone says, if this is your first time visiting with us, it's a fun day to visit. <laughs> um, another thing to let you know, there are guest and fellowship pads that are inside on the inside sides of your pews. There are little red pads. If you, whether you are visiting with us for the first time or you're a longtime member, if you could sign in and let us know you're here, we would love to be able to keep track of you, let you know that we're thinking of you and praying for you. So if you could register your, your attendance, we would greatly appreciate it. Now, with all of that business out of the way, it is our privilege to worship God, and I invite you to join us as we begin our worship by standing as we sing our processional hymn, This Is My Song, Hymn 437.
Now I invite you to remain standing as we continue our worship by proclaiming together the basics of our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Let us say these words together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Brothers and sisters, as we continue in worship, part of our calling as a people who follow Jesus is to be a people of prayer. And so we pray for each other not only on Sunday mornings, but throughout our week. And I lift up to you uh, Pat and Diane Morgan in celebration of the birth of their grandson, Oliver Brooks. We also want to uh, keep in our prayers of thanksgiving uh, a posture of gratitude for uh, holiday festival, which you'll hear more about this morning, and also as we approach uh, our observation of Veterans Day, keep those veterans in your family and in your neighborhood in your prayers as they uh, observe this important day. Friends, let's pray together. Oh God, we give you thanks this morning for the opportunity that we have to gather in your house. We're grateful, oh God, for a community, for the opportunity to be joined not just to you, but to each other even this morning. Oh God, as we consider what a homecoming might mean for us, we're aware that there are those even here who, far from a homecoming, that we are traveling away from you. And I pray, oh God, that you would speak a word of reconciliation to us. Help us to know, oh God, that there is a home awaiting us, and it is a home born of your love. And likewise, God, there are those here who have turned our eyes and our hearts towards home, but we're not sure what we'll find when we get there. And I pray, O oh God, for a word of assurance from you that as we make our way back to you, what we will find is a God with open arms, a God full of grace, hope, comfort, and peace. Oh God, you know that our hearts are heavy. For many of us, our hearts are heavy with concerns. There are those in our families who are ill. There are family relationships who are strained. There are uh, jobs that are uncertain. We pray, oh God, that your presence would be, may, would be strong among us. We pray, oh God, that our, our eyes would see you moving among our families and our friends. We pray, oh God, that our hearts would feel your presence this morning. You know, O oh God, that there are concerns too deep even to voice. So we offer them to you even now in the silence of our hearts. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you are a listening God and you hear the cries of your people. We pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. I invite you I invite you now to share in this video I love my church because this is where we raised our family and where we continue to grow and fellowship with great friends. I love our church because it is a part of every day, of every week, of every year since we've moved to Dunwoody. We've been able to get involved when our kids were real little till we recently were able to celebrate a marriage here. And it is such a blessing to Jeannie and I. And now that our kids come here, we are so in love with that aspect of DUMC. There's always been a part of my life, the Methodist Church. I was, I was born and raised in New York City and uh, traveled around a bit and ended up here the last years. But uh, I needed a base. I needed some place where the community and I could get together. And for me to learn things about the city and the schools and the people. And so this has become my church home. And I've enjoyed every minute of it. One of the first things I ever did at DUMC was attending preschool. Through this program, I gained a love for learning new things and I learned how to make friends. I learned sportsmanship through recreation programs at DUMC. I started playing soccer when I was three and I still enjoy playing on the basketball team. The music program at Dominion United Methodist Church gave me the knowledge and appreciation that I have for music. Through great day of service and participation in food stock, I have learned about the joy of helping others. Most importantly, this church has taught me everything I know about my religion. I was baptized here when I was three months old. I participated in VBS at a young age, and I still go to Sunday school every Sunday morning. Now, I love our church. It is uh, fantastic, uh, especially our Sunday school class, the interpreters. I love our music programs. We are so blessed. Uh, I get to, to ring handbells, followed by the women's choir, uh, and then in the evening we have the chancel choir, so I get all my music in on Wednesday. I'd always heard that Dunwoody was a great church, but I didn't know the half of it until we moved here and became part of this tremendous community. We are so blessed to have such strong laity who are so dedicated to a church that they love. They give of their time and their talent and their energy. They give their insight and lead with great foresight. It is a gift to work with laity such as you. And the staff team that we have assembled here is a wonderful gift to me. We get to work together day in and day out to try and reach this community in new ways for Christ. It is a gift to serve a church that is at the heart of its community, that is reaching out in mission and coming back there to be reoxygenated, to be able to get new strength, to be able to serve in mission, to be able to reach the next generation for Christ, to be able to worship God together here in this place and see the lives of people changed. I have seen the hearts and lives of people changed, transformed by the renewing of their minds, by the touching of their hearts in worship, and by seeing their hands at work at a holiday festival or a Habitat house. We have a great church and we are blessed, and I trust there are even greater things ahead, for God will continue to do amazing things in and through us if we will just faithfully follow and be willing to give fully of ourselves. Thank you for being all in, in so many different ways, in ways that make this an amazing community of faith in which to serve and in which to worship. Bless you, thank you.
You may be seated. I'm told that when you go all in, you're supposed to lay all your cards on the table. So I'd like to lay all my cards on the table and ask you to see in your pew if you see one of these cards. These are our 2022 estimate of giving cards. Uh, there's also a place to be able to scan and to do that online. But it asks some very simple things, your name, your address, uh, your email address, and it asks you to consider what God is calling you to do to underwrite the ministry and mission of this church in the year going forward. About half of our people have already made a estimate of giving online or sent those in in advance, and we are well on our way to uh, being able to fund ministry and mission in this community for the coming year. So I'm grateful for what you've already done and your continued faithfulness. If you're visiting with us today, there's a line on there that may uh, pertain to you. It says, I plan to attend church in person this many Sundays. I plan to attend online this many Sundays. So although, although we're not asking you for an estimate of giving, uh, you might want to ask what God is calling you to do in, fo in form of attendance so you might fill that out as well as we're stressing presence this year that we have a chance to be back present together. I hope we have a chance to be present without masks sooner rather than later. Uh, we are in the substantial area still here in DeKalb and Fulton County, but we are so close to moderate. So keep up the good work so that we may be able to even worship more fully together in the days ahead. So after communion, you'll be asked if you have a ch had a chance to fill this out and to bring it to the altar, to pray over it at the altar, and then to leave it in one of the baskets as you leave. We will also be inviting you to come and kneel at the altar and pray about whatever you need to pray about. And we've also extended our All Saints Remembrance another week. You may not have been here last week and didn't get a chance to light a candle in remembrance of someone that you love, and you can come and light a candle and spend some time in prayer in remembrance of them uh, after our communion service together. It is great to be here with you, and I appreciate the way that you are all in. If everyone would do something, we'd be able to continue to do even more amazing things here in our community of faith. I want to take you back in time. Are you ready? I want to take you back in time to July the 10th. It was a Saturday night. It was in Miami, Florida. The Braves were playing the Marlins, and Ronald Acuna, number 13, leapt to try and catch a ball and tore his ACL. And everybody knew that when he was out for the season, that our season for the Braves was over. Amen? When the best player on your team, maybe one of the best players in baseball, goes down there in the middle of the season, you know that the season is virtually over. There was an 8.3% chance that they would go to the playoffs, and when they lost the next night, the night before the All-Star game, it went down to 7.9%. There was no way that this was going to happen, but there was a number on the field. There was a number etched into the outfield of Truist Park. Do you know what it is? 44, that number etched into the outfield. And do you know how many games the Braves had won at the time Ronald Acuna went down? Do you know how many games they'd lost? Do you know how many games they won after Ronald Acuna went down? There's a trend here. You have to believe that hammer, hammering Hank Aaron is looking down from heaven, just loving that the number 44 is coming up over and over again because he died on 1 21 Add those together for the slow folks. 1 21 Very good. They even tried to say that's the number of hits the Braves had or the number of runs that the Braves had. It didn't work out quite that way. But still, what an amazing thing. The veteran players. The veteran players, my heart went out to them, like Freddie Freeman. He had been there for so long, so hopeful, and it looked like his hopes were dashed. I'd like to say a word about veterans today. Do we have any here in our midst? If you're a veteran, would you please stand and let us honor you this day for your work and for your ministry?
for the sacrifices that you made and others alongside you made for all of us. We give you thanks for that work. And you think of a veteran like Freddie Freeman who is used to Atlanta sports. What could go wrong? A starting pitcher breaks his leg in game one of the World Series. Check, that's Atlanta sports. That's just how this goes. The storm clouds start to roll in. And then in game six, the starting pitcher goes over to first base to take a play and someone steps on his ankle. This is Atlanta sports at its best. You just know what's going to happen. You thought at that moment that your playoff hopes were fried. (laughs) But that's not how you say the name, is it? That's not how he pronounces his name. He pitched six scoreless innings and the Braves were freed. Max freed. They were freed to win the World Series. And he wears number which is the year that Hank Aaron joined the Braves. My neighbor over on Lisa Lane, Nick Rollator, sent a note out that said, if you take the numbers of the Braves who died this year, some of the, uh, you know, the most famous Braves in the organization, Phil Necro, Don Sutton, and Hank Aaron, and add their numbers up, it comes to 99 which is how many games the Braves won in the regular season and the postseason. It's been a miraculous season. What I'm hoping is I will never have to see those replays of Sid Bream beating my Pirates again. (laughs) I'm not bitter. And today we turn to three brave women three brave women in our scripture text today. It is a long scripture text, but I ask you to pay attention to this wonderful story that has implications far beyond itself. It is a story that continues to echo throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament of three brave women who deal with hardship and loss together. Hear these words from Ruth, the first chapter. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went out to live in the country of Moab, and 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 he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left with her two sons, without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband." And she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will not return with you. We will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that you may, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. She said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, even if death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. 
This is the good news according to the book of Ruth. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for these ancient words, for the way that they echo in our hearts and minds today, and for the way that you continue to provide in the midst of pain and in the midst of loss and in the midst of suffering. May we seek your blessing even in difficult days. In your name we pray. Amen. This is a story that begins in famine. There is famine that causes Naomi and her family to move from Bethlehem of Judea, which means house of bread or house of food. It shouldn't be a place where there is famine, but ironically, that is where the famine comes. So they get up and they move to the hill country of Moab to higher elevation, hoping that there is going to be sufficient food there. And they live there for some 10 years. They marry local girls, and after marrying local girls, things start to go poorly. Those local girls have no children with them. Their father dies. The two boys die. And that is where we find ourselves at the beginning of the book of Ruth. Naomi not having many choices. Women in that day needed men to provide for them. There were not many good ways for women to be able to provide for themselves. So they were more dependent on those men. And with them all gone, she hears rumor. She hears rumor that the Lord is providing food again. Bethlehem has now become a house of bread again. They're having supply chain issues in Moab, so it's time to go back to Bethlehem because the Lord is providing there. And so she gets up with her two daughters-in-law and they start to make that trip, that dangerous trip across the Jordan River below the Dead Sea from Moab back into Judah. They begin to make that journey together. And as they begin to that, make that journey together, I think Naomi has second thoughts. And she looks at her daughters-in-law and she tells them, you need to turn back. You don't need to follow after me. Turn back. Go to your mother's houses, which may mean they've had even more loss because you would usually hear them talk about my father's house or the father's houses. But they said, you go back to your mother's house go back to your mother's house because they may have even lost their fathers as well as their father-in-law and their husbands. Turn around, go back. And then she offers a word of blessing to them. She offers a word of blessing to them. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt kindly with me and with the dead. She gets a blessing from, she gives a blessing to her daughters-in-law. Now, how many of you ever had a blessing from your mother-in-law? Good. Not a blessing out, but a blessing. She receives this wonderful blessing, and basically she says, may God's has said, may God's loving kindness be upon you. This is a beautiful, beautiful blessing. She's trying to let these young women know that it's okay to let go. And then finally, she basically says a prayer over them. And this prayer must have been very difficult because the prayer that she prays is for them to find security in their new husband's homes. This is a mother who's lost two boys. And in losing two boys, she says to her daughters-in-law, it's okay for you to remarry. Please remarry. I think that's where you will find hope. And then they kiss and they weep over one another, for that is what you do. You weep over people when they leave, unless they've stayed too long for Thanksgiving. <laughs> you weep over them, and they start to part ways, and these young women look at their mother-in-law and say, no, we want to go with you to your people. We're going to follow you to your people. So I think Naomi puts her foot down and she says, you don't know what folly it is to follow me. I know that, you know, when, when a man dies, you're supposed to be able to his, marry his brother. Just think of this. Even if I found a man today, I couldn't get pregnant quick enough to give you a husband. This is not going to work out. There's just no way. I'm a dead end for you. You need to turn back. There's at least hope for you there in your mother's houses. And then she says this. For the Lord has dealt more bitterly with me than with you. For the hand of the Lord has turned against me. It's a very painful phrase there in the text. 
as she feels like the hand of the Lord has turned against her. And then you see her daughters-in-law weep even more, not because they were saying goodbye. They begin to weep this time because Naomi's name literally means sweet. This is sweet Naomi, and sweet Naomi has started to chew on bitterness. And when you chew on bitterness, it starts to infect all of you. And she's beginning to let her bitterness dominate her life, no longer being sweet Naomi. And she even believes that the hand of the Lord has turned against her. And that is a place where I want to weep as well when people feel like the hand of the Lord has turned against them. For the God that I worship is a God that is for us, a God that is for you, that wants the best for you and is able to walk with us even during the most difficult and painful times. Would that we could take the bitter and the sourness of our life and make it sweet. Well, in fact... God has created something called a miracle berry. There's a technical name that we can show you. It's up there on the screen. Uh, this is the technical name, uh, Sincipalum dulcificum. And I've asked Brian Jordan if he will come and be my um, volunteer. We heard about miracle berries. Have you heard about miracle berries? They come from a, an, a region of West Africa that's very difficult to get to. And they say that if you will eat one of these miracle berries... Do I need to get another volunteer? <laughs> that if you'll eat one of these miracle berries, I'm only going to ask you to eat four. And four. Just chew on them. Two, three, four. There you go. And just chew on them and let them coat your tongue. Just count to 30 for me. One, everybody. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You get the idea. And what they tell us, and Elizabeth and I experimented with this, what they tell us is that after you take these miracle berries, there is a protein in them called miraculin that will coat your tongue and allow things that are otherwise sour to taste sweet. You can even try Sour Patch Kids. What? Those are for your kids. Thank you, Brian. It is a beautiful thing that God has created something in nature that can take even the most sour thing and allow it to become sweet. But that doesn't seem to be how it works in our lives. You can't seem to instantaneously take something bitter that you've been chewing on for far too long and to make it sweet. But there is a ray of hope. There is a ray of hope for Naomi. Ruth looks at her. Ruth looks at her when she tells her to go away. And Orpah, the other daughter-in-law, does go away. But Ruth stays and she clings to her mother-in-law. I don't even like that term. My father never called Elizabeth his daughter-in-law. He said it wasn't law that brought her into the family. It was love that brought her into the family. And because it was love that brought her into the family, he always called her his daughter in love. His daughter in love. And so the relationship between this mother in love and this daughter in love is such that they are clinging to one another. Matt reminded me that it's not just a phrase of physical clinging, but it's a deep kinship bond where she chooses her mother-in-law and you remember those famous words whither thou goest I will go your people will be my people your God will be my God she has seen something in Naomi that she wants to emulate she's seen something in Naomi that she doesn't want to be separated from that deep gift of love that was sweet Naomi and she is worried about her mother-in-law as she is spiraling down into bitterness and she wants to reassure her that she will not be alone because the truth is that life gives each of us more than we could ever handle alone. 
Naomi doesn't know the full story yet. Naomi isn't able to read ahead in the book like we are. We already knew the story that the Braves had won. She didn't know. She didn't know what would happen. Today happens to be the birthday of Billy Graham who once said, I'm an optimist. Do you know why? He said, it's because I read the last page of the Bible and everything turns out great in the end. I wish that Naomi in this, this moment of pain and hurt could have been able to read the last page of the book of Ruth. I hope you'll go home and read it. We'll be dealing with that in worship in two weeks. The last page of the book of Ruth. It is a beautiful ending to the story, but at the time she was feeling such pain and feeling such bitterness. It's like another woman whose birthday is today. Roberta Joan Anderson was born today in 1943 in Alberta, Canada. She grew up in Saskatchewan and at age nine she got polio and it took the strength out of her hands. And so she wanted to be an artist, she wanted to be a musician, but she had a hard time being able to make the guitar chords that other people made. She wanted to learn the guitar, so her mother bought her a ukulele of all things. And not being thwarted, she said, I want to learn on a guitar. So she borrowed a guitar, took an old Pete Seeger songbook and learned to play the guitar. But she couldn't make the chords that other people made because she'd lost the strength in her left hand. And so she did an open chord structure. And that open chord structure allowed her, Chuck, to make some really beautiful music. Some beautiful music. And she didn't turn bitter after polio but she started to feel bitter sorrow and pain when she had a child when she was far too young and her boyfriend left and she was left with no one to help her raise the child. And so she gave her child up for adoption. And when she gave her child up for adoption, she said, I spent the rest of my years writing lyrics to a child I would never get to raise. And she gave us some amazing lines like these. Don't you know, let me see if I can, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone. And when the clouds rolled into her life, she sang things like this, rows and bows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air. And feather canyons everywhere. I've looked at clouds that way. And then you can hear the pain in, 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 in her voice. But now they only block the sun. They rain and snow on everyone. So many things I could have done. But clouds got in the way. Naomi is in the midst of all those clouds and they are coming down upon her and Ruth like a ray of sunshine comes and says I'm not going to let you do life alone I am going to be with you and they move back to Bethlehem together how many of you ever had to move how many of you ever I mean not chose to move but had to move or been told to move you know, moving, nobody loves moving, but I have to tell you, Elizabeth and I have moved some nine times in our life, and every time that we've moved, although the packing is a pain, it has brought and expanded our horizons. It has brought wonderful new people like y'all into our lives. It has opened things into who we are and who we get to become. And they moved together back to Bethlehem. That's what God did for Abraham back in the very beginning. God got Abraham moving. And when God got Abraham moving, he promised him that he would be the father of nations. And Ruth got moving. Not because she had to, but because she wanted to. Because she wanted to, she chose to go with Naomi. She chose to move with her. And Abraham became the father of nations. And Ruth, by making this choice to cling to Naomi, became the mother of kings. She made a sacrifice. And in making that sacrifice, she allowed the line of David and thus the line of Jesus to be born through her. It's an amazing story. 
You hear it at the end of the book of Ruth. You hear it at the beginning of the book of Matthew. And Ruth's name is there among just a few names of women in the genealogy of Jesus. Because she made a sacrifice. True sacrifice will always bring a blessing. True sacrifice will always bring a blessing. But it will not always bring a blessing to you. There's, this is not about some sort of prosperity gospel where you give a blessing to get a blessing. You give a blessing to be a blessing to others. You make a sacrifice in order to be able to touch the lives of others. God is able to bring beauty through sacrifice. God is able to take even the most bitter and make it sweet because of sacrifice. Because of the ultimate sacrifice as we gather around this table. A table that came through the line of Ruth, through David, through Jesse, through Joseph, through Jesus. We come together to this table through Mary. We come together to this table because a sacrifice has been made that has offered a blessing that will not just take the taste out of your mouth for a moment, Brian, or maybe 10 minutes, but will continually allow you to take the even most bitter moments of your life and taste the sweetness of forgiveness and to let that be the taste that changes and transforms you. We come to the table today and I ask you to bring your bitterness, your strife, your loss upon loss upon loss and allow God to redeem that as good news because of the forgiveness that is offered at this table. The table is set before you. It is a sacrifice that echoes in blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this meal that we are about to partake and the chance that we have to bring our sin, to bring our bitterness, to bring our pain before you as you, through sacrifice, bring us forgiveness and grace. Help us to treasure the gift. Help us to know that our season isn't over until it's over. Amen. As we prepare to share this holy feast, I want to make sure that each of you are uh, equipped with the uh, communion elements that you will need to partake. If any of you all still need communion elements, just give a little wave. Our ushers will be happy to help you out. Now, friends, Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear this good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And this proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets. 
And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When when the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this In remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and make these gifts of bread and cup be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Friends, because there is one love, one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in the one loaf. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The body of Christ is broken for you, and the blood of Christ is shed for you. If you will, remove the top layer of cellophane as you receive the body of Christ. And then remove the second layer and receive the cup. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself for us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus the Christ, who is our Lord. Amen. Amen. And so as the choir comes to be able to share with us this day, we invite you to prayerfully consider what God is calling you to do 
and come to the altar as you feel led. Come and to light a candle in memory of someone as we respond because there just isn't enough that we can sacrifice to say thank you to what God has done for us. May we leave the communion table today with the number 44 on our lips, Philippians 4.4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Will you come as you feel led?
We give thanks for a day of remembering, a day of beautiful music, and a day of hope to move forward. We had a wonderful day yesterday with our holiday festival. I'm so grateful for all of you who worked so hard and some of you who just spent money. <laughs> but up in the balcony are Ellen and Nathan Sparks. I don't know where George and Don, John, Don again are. I don't know if they're at this service or <clears throat> our other leaders, Kevin and Lindsey Braun. So many of you, like Karen Jordan, they gave so much time and energy to make a difference so that someone could have a home, so that someone could have a homecoming. And I'm grateful for the efforts and the work that all of you did to make yesterday such a wonderful day. And we had three families visit our early service because you were so nice to them yesterday as they came and visited. It is a wonderful thing. Last yesterday afternoon, one of the artisans had lost $300 in $100 bills, and she was frantic. You know, it could have been like all the profit that she'd made that day, and she was frantic. And she didn't know what she was going to do. She was retracing her steps, trying to figure out where to find her money. And the kind of people in this church, somebody found her three $100 bills and turned them into lost and found. She was so thrilled. She came by my house last night and was just so thankful and wanted me to know what kind of church that we have. I'm grateful to be able to serve a church like this for the vision that God has given us that we stand to sing of at this moment. Be thou my vision. Will you lift your voices? If you haven't got a chance to read the end of the book, I invite you to do so. Check out, turn to the last page of the book of Ruth. Turn to the last page of Revelation and see that it's all okay in the end. It may not feel like that now, but your season is never over until it's over. If you need more Bibles or books, our book nook is open till 1230. I'm sure they'll stay till you get there. You can spend $5 and take home more books than you'd ever want or need. Just fill up a bag of books and take them home to irritate the rest of your family members. <laughs> Go forth. May you help others to feel that they are not alone 
May you be a ray of sunshine into someone's bitterness. And may you be able to leave your bitterness and strife at this place as you go tasting the sweetness of forgiveness. Amen. Thank you.